at the Rhode Island Short Film Festival. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome writer, director, George Sugis to the show. Welcome, George. Thank you so much for having me. Great to meet you. Great to be here. Well, I tell you what, I fell in love with the One Note Man. So what inspired you to write this story? Well, I was going through a Hitchcock phase and I was rewatching all of his films and I read the Truffaut book again and I was listening to, uh, to, to, to an interview on YouTube, which uh, was just the audio uh, interview, no, it wasn't, uh, there was no picture. And he was talking about the man who knew too much, with Jimmy Stewart and Doris Day. And uh, the film starts famously with a caption that says, a single crash of symbols and how it rocked the lives of an American family. And then we open on an orchestra and the camera s starts zooming in onto this man st standing there with his symbols, just waiting for his cue to crash them. And eventually he crashes the symbols and the movie starts. So Hitchcock explains that he got the idea for this opening for the man who knew too much when he saw a 1921 illustration in the funnies by an artist called H.M. Bateman, British artist, which showed a musician waking up in the morning, having his breakfast, putting on his clothes, riding the bus to work, walking the steps to, up to uh, Albert Hall, sitting at his place in the orchestra, patiently waiting for his cue. And when the conductor cues him, he plays a single note. After which, his job is done. He waits for his cue to get up. He gets it. He walks back to the bus, takes the bus home, has dinner, brushes teeth, and goes to bed. And I thought, wow, that's, that's an idea you can hold in your palm. It's such a clean idea for a short film. So I developed it into a love story um, about taking that brave step into the unknown and of perseverance. Well, why did you choose the bassoon as the instrument of choice for the lead character? Because it's funny. <laughs> So, you know, I decided that this is going to be a comedy. I mean, it, it, it just, uh, I, I did decide this. It spoke to me. This is a comedy. Obviously, it's a rom-com. So, you know, we needed an intro, uh, I needed a, to find an instrument that's, that's funny. And for some reason, the bassoon makes me laugh. The, the sound and also the way it looks and it's big and it's, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It's just a funny instrument. Well, it, it absolutely works. Now, I loved how a film can be so entertaining without dialogue. And when working with no dialogue, what does the script actually look like to an actor? <laughs> well, I would, I would think it looks uh, at, at parts delightful because uh, the actor doesn't have to remember the dialogue. But at other parts, I would think quite scary because uh, the actor needs to convey everything um, um, th through body language, through micro acting, because you don't want to be too on the nose um, on everything. And, and Jason, Jason Watkins, wonderful actor, um, was just absolutely marvelous in that sort of, uh, you know, acting. So in his so measured acting and uh, just conveying the story brilliantly with his eyes and his body language. Well, see, that, that brings me up to my next question because with no dialogue, for you as a director, how do you balance between the character's movements and facial expressions as well as the camera's ability to tell the story? Well, that's a good question. Um, I never saw it as anything different than when I'm shooting with dialogue. So you want to tell a story. So you're doing exactly the same thing you're doing as if you have dialogue. And maybe music replaces dialogue. And I have the amazing, amazing fortune to work with uh, uh, Academy Award winning composer Stephen Warbeck, who won an Oscar for Shakespeare in Love and who's, who's done uh, Billy Elliot also in many other movies. But amazing composer. So uh, Stephen became my co-storyteller 
And we journeyed together and we started, Stephen was the first person to start working on the movie um, as early as five months before we shot it because Stephen replaced a lot of dialogue. So I, for me, for this particular film, the challenge wasn't the fact that there was no dialogue. That was the, in the script stage, that was the challenge. It was like, okay, I'm at page five. Can I take it to page six without dialogue? Can it hold? Can I tell the story? And it turns out that uh, I, I could. But uh, in terms of making the film, it wasn't much different in that respect. But it was challenging, very challenging, because it was, it was like a puzzle, this, this thing. Because of the repetition, because of the, you know, um, the, 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 the montage sequences. And yeah, it was almost like I, Groundhog Day. It was all, it's exactly, yeah, like Groundhog Day, but you don't want to shoot everything. When you shoot the, the second day, it's a different shot. It's a different lens. It's, it's different performance. So every single little bit that you see in the montage sequences is a new setup, is a new storyboard. It's a, it's a new design for a, a new little story. So that was really challenging. I mean, the, the, I've never had a slate before that says two slash one point two m four three. It was it was it was uh, you know a crazy. Puzzle. Well, did you did you have the film scored before you actually filmed it? I mean, did Steven score this completely before you started rolling film? <clears throat> Absolutely, he scored it completely. Uh, but the music is original mu music, and and it was um, it was it was really particular with this. But normally, as you know, you shoot a film, you lock picture, and then composer comes in and you, you spot music and you, they score. But with this one, because we had that section of the orchestra, and the orchestra needs to play to needs to uh, we need to film to playback because you can't expect them to be performing live uh, 25 times uh, you know, uh, a day. So, and also quality needs to be the same. So playback, which means we, we, we needed to have that orchestral section recorded before we started filming. So yes, we recorded that um, in December and we shot the film in March. So we had that, but also there was another reason. Um, because I storyboarded the whole movie. But for that particular scene, there was a moment where he falls in love and he hears the violin and he hears it first and he falls in love with the music first and then he sees the, the, the beautiful woman, the violinist. Um, I needed to know exactly how, I needed to know if the music that was available to me was long enough to tell the story based on the shots I had storyboarded. So what I did is I provided Steven with, an, with a, a, a pre-visualization, a pre-vis of the sequence, which is basically an animated storyboard, so that Steven could see exactly how long I needed for the violin solo to go on for in order to tell the story with, with the shots. Um, and then he wrote to that length. So it was a, a, a sort of a prop process in reverse in this uh, occasion. Super fascinating. Well, one of the things I was watching, because I watched it more than once, because I really wanted to just try to look into the film and look at all the little nuances that really built the story. Because, you know, when, it, when you're doing a short film, <clears throat> and they can range from five minutes to, to 20 minutes, it's amazing how much a director can get in to a film. And if you're having, a, if you're doing a film and there's no dialogue, um, did you ever have to tell the actor, uh, let's reshoot this? And if you did, why? I mean, was the expression not spot on or was the look of the eyes a little off? I mean, how would you tell an actor, let's do this again? Well, when you're working with an actor of Jason's caliber, um, you're really fine-tuning on the day. So uh, Jason came 
completely prepared. He learned to play the bassoon. He could play the bassoon so well, his, his part, his, his one note and then the solo in the end, so well that we had a, a, a bassoon expert on the set, a, 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 like an advisor, who said, I buy this. He's playing it. It's incredible. So Jason was so prepared that I really didn't have to really say much to Jason other than, like a conductor, um, make sure that the timing was right. So for, for what I had in mind in terms of edit, in terms of where we were, because, you know, when we're shooting montage four, which is, you know, the later stage of the repetition, that's a lot faster than montage one. So I would go to Jason and, you know, explain where we were at any given point. And because we, we shot, we stack shot those sections, obviously, facing this way, shoot everything this way. So uh, as you do. Um, so that was uh, really the extent. So, but you know what? We started, we started the movie, and we would discuss a little bit. But by by the end of day one, it was like faster. Just do it faster. That was the the, the extent of my direction. <laughs> well, how many how many days did it take you to uh, to shoot the whole film? I shot it in five days. In so we five doing, days. In five days, we were. I was doing forty setups a day, which is pretty fast. And I had two cameras for uh, the orchestra um, part, which which makes sense, which, you, you know, I need it. But otherwise, single camera, five days. And Jason actually played the solo. Jason towards the end. learned to play the bassoon. It's not him actually playing the uh, the, the recording was uh, was recorded by a, a professional bassoonist. Uh, but uh, but he could he could play the bassoon and he could play and he did play his uh, solo on the day, and the uh, uh, expert on set said he's he's doing it. I, I buy this. Incredible. You know, I thought I thought one of the best examples of acting, and of course, ladies and gentlemen, there's no dialogue in this film, and it doesn't need any. But you know, you chose actress Crystal Yu as the conductor. And I loved her because mm. her eyes told you what she was thinking when she was glaring at Jason Watkins. Yes. And I yes. love that. Yes, that's great that you saw that. Because I don't know if you remember Fantasia. And, you know, we go back to the birth of cinema, which was silent, of course. And if I think of all the movie moments which really are burned into my memory... And those moments that stay with me, they're all without dialogue. They're all visual moments of pure cinematic visual storytelling. Um, Disney's Fantasia, the, the first 25 minutes of 2001. And by the way, there are, there's 88 minutes of, of no dialogue in that film. That's a, that's a feature film, you know, worth of, footage with no dialogue, a story told no dialogue. It's a lesson in filmmaking. 88 minutes, yeah. Well, you're, and you're right about Fantasia. I well, mean, and, think and about Blue, Blue Velvet, the beginning of Blue Velvet, uh, the girl in the red coat in Schindler's List, the recent amazing, incredible genius movieola scene in The Fablements where the kid realizes his mother's having an affair with his uncle. What a, what a cinematic moment with no dialogue, just, just pictures. Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, the list goes on. So the golden rule is don't, if, don't, if you can, don't say it if you can show it. That's the golden rule. So Crystal was just phenomenal. And she was, I, I told one thing, I said, Crystal, remember the wizard in Disney's Fantasia? He's, he's stern, but, but, but also, He's, he's like a father. There's love in there. That's the, that's the conductor. You know, you know. so he's there, she, she's there to chastise, but also in the end, she recognizes the hero's perseverance and spirit and the fact he did step into the unknown and the fact that perhaps, um, you know, in his hero's journey, he also answered the question of who am I? Um, 